the Lady Mount Carmel, St. Joseph, Father Brian Lanteri, St. Ignatius, all God's angels and saints. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So good evening. So this evening's conference will be a follow-up, a sequela to what we started last night. Last night, uh, most of you were with me last night, we gave you a summary of a writing of Pope Paul VI. The name of the writing of Pope Paul VI was Marialis Cultus, and it's a wonderful church document on the role and place of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the church, but most specifically in the liturgy itself. We mentioned that to have a proper Mariology there are three underlying principles to have a, an integral Mariology. And that is, it should, be, it should be biblical, it should be Christological, and it should be ecclesial. Remember those three words, okay? It should be biblical, it should be Christological, and it should be ecclesial. Biblical means that we all, all of you who have a great love for Mary, you probably all know approved Marian apparitions. I mentioned three of the most prominent last night. Mexico, Our Lady of Guadalupe. In France, Our Lady of Lourdes. In Portugal, Fatima. Those are probably the most well-known Marian approved apparitions. However, we can't base all of our Mariology just on private apparitions. That would be an incomplete Mariology. So it's based on biblical passages, biblical typology of the Old Testament, Mary being the second Eve, the Ark of the Covenant, but also abundant sources of references to Mary in the New Testament, especially Luke chapter 1 and 2. Those are two chapters where you have the five joyful mysteries. And then a proper Mariology has to include ecclesiology, which is Mary's role within the church. The church is the mystical body of Christ. Christ is the head of the body, we are the members. So some of the saints say that if Christ is the head, we the members, Mary's the neck, okay? <laughs> Mary's the neck, so we don't have the hunchback of Notre Dame, we actually have a neck, right? And that neck is the Blessed Virgin Mary. She connects the head to the members. So, I went through yesterday the document of Marialis Cultus, giving you the Marian feast days during the course of the year, and hopefully you memorize them overnight. Hopefully you memorize them overnight. Or if not, you'll do it within the next 24 hours, okay? I may corner you and ask you, okay? So we haven't finished, or I'd like to finish this, and then I'd like to move into another topic that really builds upon this. These lectures will be like building, kind of like my spiritual exercises program, building different floors or stories. Okay, we'd arrive. And we had actually finished the month of August, right? The month of August, there are two Marian 
feast days. One is a solemnity, another one is a, an optional memorial. The solemnity would be in the very middle of August, August 15th, we celebrate the Assumption of Mary into Heaven. Then a week later, we celebrate the Queenship of Mary. Mary as being the Queen of Heaven and Earth. Mary, the Queen of the Angels. And those happen to be the last two mysteries of the Rosary, right? You've got the fourth and the fifth glorious mystery would be the Assumption of Mary into Heaven and then Mary's crowning as Queen of Angels and Saints. Now, September, probably most of you, if I were just to say September, probably most of you would not be able to tell me the Marian feast days in September, but you will after my class tonight, okay? Okay, this is a very important month for the Oblates, okay? For the Oblates, the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. I'm surprised, maybe because I'm somewhat naive in my, in my, my uh, older years, but I would think that if I, I'm close to someone and I forget that person's birthday, I would feel that that's, that's an offense. I would say probably 95% of the Catholics in the world don't even know the birthday of the Blessed Mother. That, that's a shame, isn't it? It's a shame. We know Jesus' is birthday. Shouldn't we know the birthday of the second most important person that ever came to planet Earth? We should know it. All right. So that a little bit of mathematics. What do we celebrate December 8th? I mentioned that yesterday. Hopefully you didn't forget it. The Immaculate Conception. What is that? It's not the virginal conception, but the Immaculate Conception. It's the conception of Mary in the womb of Saint Anne. By the way, it's going to be the feast day of Saint Anne this week. Saint Anne. Have any of you ever been to Canada? None of you. Ever heard of Canada? If you ever go there, go to Saint Anne de Beaupre. It's like the Lords of Canada, where there are so many healings. You see these crutches and these votive offerings. I went there about 60 years ago. I barely remember, but I remember that that you had these crutches and these votive offerings. Saint Anne de Beaupre, which is the mother of Mary. So the Immaculate Conception took place in the womb of Saint Anne. Okay, December, count nine months. Okay, nine months. January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September 8th. What do we celebrate? You got it. Okay. So Mary's conception in the womb of it, St. Anne, okay, count nine months. Usually nine months is the gestation period of a baby in the womb of a mother, usually if it's a full term, right? So we've got the 8th of September is the birthday of Mary. Don't forget her birthday this coming year, okay? Celebrate it. Go to Mass, receive communion, go to confession, and then uh, buy a birthday cake, okay? And put on a little bit more than 2,000 candles, okay? <laughs> you can't buy a birthday cake, at least a Twinkie, but better to have a birthday cake, okay? September 8th. All right. What do we celebrate September 12th? Did any of you ever hear of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary? Yeah. No. No? Hey, here I am. I'm one of them, okay? We're, I'm one of them. One of the Oblates was asked, 
how many of you in the world? He said, well, we're less than 12,000, we're, we're, we're less than 20,000. You know how many we are? 150, okay? So the titular feast day of the Oblates is the 12th of September, when we made our first vows, and then our second vows, and then our perpetual vows, and then we renew them every year. But I don't think any of you know what we celebrate the September 12th. It happens to be the holy name of Mary. Okay, you got that? The holy name of Mary, we celebrate September 12th. And for us, if you go to St. Peter Chanel, that's, that's a solemnity. It's almost like the Immaculate Conception for the Oblates because that's our titular feast day. Our titular feast day. The holy name of Mary. Spanish, dulce nombre de Maria. In Italian, dolce nombre de Maria. The holy name of Mary. All right. September 14th, we celebrate the exaltation of the Holy Cross. So what do you think we celebrate after that? Our Lady of Sorrows. Very, the juxtaposition is perfect, isn't it? Jesus on the cross, Mary underneath the cross, Our Lady of Sorrows. So you learned something new today, huh? September, you probably didn't even, didn't, never occurred to you that in September you got three important Marian feast days. Mary's birthday, Mary's holy name, and Mary's suffering underneath the cross with Jesus on the cross. So there we have the month of September. Okay, let's move from the month of September to October. Okay, then the month of October is the month of the Most Holy Rosary. Okay, got that? It's the month of the Most Holy Rosary. But we only have one, one formal Marian feast day. And that would be October 7th. October 7th. Which is, October is the month of the Rosary. October 7th is the formal feast day of Our Lady of the Rosary. So that's the one day, October 7th. Now, Our Lady of the Rosary. The history behind this is, is extraordinary. Here in LA, not too far from this church, you go to East LA, you have a church that gave missions there three times already. With Father Armando, no? It's called La Victoria. You've ever been in Compton, any of you? You ever been in Compton? Compton, you've got three churches. I've been, you have mission in three of them. One is La Victoria. La Victoria is Our Lady of the Rosary, which goes back to the famous naval battle of Lepanto, okay? As Catholics, you really, you have to know the Battle of Lepanto to be a, a well-educated Catholic. It's probably the most important naval battle in the history of Catholicism. And it was a battle between the Muslims, the Muslims and the Catholics. And the Muslims had a huge army and navy. The Catholics were rinky-dink at best. Rinky-dink is the best way of explaining it, no? It was, like, it was like David against Goliath. It's, uh, it, it, re read up on it. Pope St. Pius V was Pope 
and he was actually a Dominican priest before and that's why the Pope wears white because he was a Dominican elected Pope and he didn't want to change his religious habit so he stuck with the white so the Catholics were fighting against the Muslims and they were losing Pope Pius V said hey you gotta pray and they prayed the rosary and the winds changed the tide turned and the Catholics caught the general in chief of the Muslim they cut his head off and the Muslims were thrown into confusion and the Catholics won the battle now we have a lot of we have a lot of Hispanics here a lot of Mexicans you're Catholic because of related Guadalupe in my genealogical tree I'm 99 percent Caucasian European that's who I am okay if it were not for the Battle of Lepanto I would be a Muslim now yes Father Broom would be a Muslim and if you have European blood you would be too because the Muslims what were they going to do? Enter into Rome, capture the Pope, enter into the Basilica of St. Peter with their mules and donkeys to insult Catholicism and turn the basilicas into mosques. And then you'd have Mecca, you've heard of Mecca, and you'd have Rome as the two centers of, of the uh, Muslim faith. So I'm eternally grateful to Our Lady of the Rosary. That's why I wrote a book on that. <laughs> if it weren't for Our Lady of the Rosary, I would be, I'd be a Muslim now. And you people of European blood, some of you do, you would, you would probably be Muslims today. So the Hispanics, as well as those who are Anglo, were Catholics because of the victory of Mary. Amen? So e even though that seems to be somewhat of a unknown feast day I think in ecclesiastical history it's one of the most important battles in the history of this church I wouldn't be here so I owe my Catholic identity to Our Lady of the Rosary I'm I'm interpreting my life in the light of history okay in the light of history amen amen or oh me amen right no okay so Our Lady of Victory, October 7th. Okay, November. November the church, uh, indirectly, there's a Marian feast day, November 1st, because it's all, it's all saints. Who's the queen of saints? Who's the queen of angels? Who's the queen of confessors? Who's the queen of virgins? Mary. Okay, so Mary is the queen of all these saints. So if you're celebrating all saints, you cannot exclude Mary. The saints would say, hey, don't forget about the queen. Okay? She's a queen. All right, there's, there's one more, and it's November 22nd. It is the presentation... It's the presentation, not of Jesus, but the presentation of Mary. The presentation of Jesus was, you remember, February 2nd, right? I, I told you yesterday, okay? February 2nd is the presentation of Jesus in the temple, 40 days after he was born. But the 22nd November is the presentation of the child Mary in the temple. Okay, so uh, one, of, uh, one of you came up to me yesterday and made a, an interesting comment. I, I'm thankful for that comment. She said, well, Father Broom, what about Pentecost? Isn't that also? So I'd like to add that. Someone made that suggestion, so I thought I'd just uh, add that to it. Uh, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descends upon the Apostles but through the intercession of Mary. And of course, Pentecost, it changes. That depends upon when Easter falls. 
But uh, one of you who suggested that to me, thank you very much, and I wanted to add that to our repertoire. So I've done my part. Now it's up to all of you to, to memorize those Marian feast days, okay? Hello? So next time you're at your, your party with your friends, what you can maybe do is, hey, go through it. It'll be maybe a 25 minute talk. It's him looking, I gotta talk now. Just listen to me. I want you to know the different Marian feast days in the church calendar. Please let me talk. And if you want, I talked an hour in my 20 minutes. Okay, maybe you can, you can maybe uh, give an abridged form, do it in 45 minutes, okay? And imagine you sitting next to a Catholic and going through how, how pleasing that would be to the Blessed Mother. Right? How pleasing that would be to the Blessed Mother. You people going through the whole church cycle, highlighting every one of the key Marian solemnities, feast days, obligatory memorials, as well as optional memorials. Now, in other countries, you're going to have other Marian feast days, okay? Other countries. Uh, but those are the key, the key ecclesial liturgical Marian feast days um, in the whole church calendar. Okay, so from there we're going to be moving on to the entire liturgical cycle, and I'll try to see if I can get it done as quickly as possible. Okay, every year the church relives the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through sign and symbol. That means through the Mass that we celebrate, we relive the life of Christ. So if you want to connect, you want to connect with the life of Christ, the, the electrical current of grace, so to speak. It's through the Mass and it's through the liturgical cycle. So that's the direct way in which we, we, we plug into, there's a good image, we plug into the, the energy that comes from God when we celebrate the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. So you're going to have, you're going to hear a lot of young people today, and some not that young, that will say, well, I, 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 I like uh, the Bible. I also, I, I, I really like Jesus Christ. And um, I pray, I pray in nature, and uh, I, I love God. But I don't like the church. You ever hear that? You hear it. And often they'll say, I don't like the church because the church is filled with hypocrites. When I hear that, I said, well, we welcome you. There's room for one more. So I'll usually say that, okay? There's room for one more. Come on, welcome, no? Welcome to the club of hypocrites. We're all hypocrites at times, in the sense that we don't live up to the high, the high dignity, the high dignity, the sublime calling. Usually when people say that, they say, whatever you say about the church is going to be true. You got the best of the best, and you got the worst of the worst. Okay, I'm going to mention six Catholics. You got the, some of the Catholics, no one can, no one can compare with the Catholics that I'm going to name. They're in a, there's supernovas up there. Who can go beyond John Paul II? You tell me. John Paul II. I was ordained by him. I got holy hair, no? <laughs> Who can go beyond John Paul II? I think, he was, I think he was the greatest pope that ever lived. Who can go beyond Mother Teresa? Who can go beyond John Bosco? Who can go beyond Teresa of Avila? Who can go beyond Maximilian Kolbe? Who can go beyond Thomas Aquinas? Who can go beyond Augustine? I mean, these, these men and women, they're, they're, they're in classes by themselves. Not only are they, they brilliant, but they're holy because they're filled with the Holy Spirit. 
So I'll, I'll, I'll mention six Catholics. John Paul II, Mother Teresa, okay, St. Thomas Aquinas, okay, are you listening? Okay, you want to hear another, three other Catholics, Adolf Hitler, jo Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, and Fidel Castro, right? We got a couple of Cubans here, right? Whether you like it or not, Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro was formed by the Jesuits, right? As well as his brother Raul. I mean, they were, they were brought up by the Jesuits in Cuba, what, 80 years ago? Adolf Hitler was not a German. Adolf Hitler was Austrian. He was baptized a Catholic. And then Joseph Stalin was, was Russian Orthodox. So he was baptized. So whatever you say about the Catholic Church is going to be true. You got the best of the best, you got the worst of the worst, and then you have a lot of in between the two extremes. <laughs> Where we fall, right? <laughs> so you're going to hear that today. You're going to hear that today that people say, yeah, I, I, I really like the Bible, I really like Jesus Christ, but the church stinks, you know? So, we have to love the church too, because the church is the mystical body of Christ. And the mystical body of Christ is one of the key names given from Lumen Gentium, the mystical body of Christ. And the mystical body of Christ, you have the channels of grace, which are the sacraments. What is a sacrament? It is an exterior sign instituted by Christ to confer grace. The definition of the Baltimore Catechism, right? Okay. An exterior sign instituted by Christ to confer grace. All right. The church year. Okay, the church year, what I'm going to say today, I've already made allusion to it going through Mary's presence, but I'm going to try to fill it in a little bit more. The church year always begins with Advent. Okay, so Advent is the beginning of the church year. When does Advent fall? Advent usually falls toward the tail end of November, sometimes even the very beginning of December. Like like uh, Lent, Advent changes. It's not, the, it's not the same every year. All right, so the church year begins with Advent. Now, if you want to understand the, 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 the chronological time zone of Advent, look at the Advent wreath. Okay, how many candles in the Advent wreath? Okay, there are four, okay, well, you can put the fifth in with Christmas. Advent can be a full, almost a full four weeks, or it could be three weeks and one day, okay? Okay, it can be almost, it can almost be a full 28 days, usually like 27 days, I think is the most it can be, but it can be, it actually can be uh, three weeks in one day. Okay? But you're, you're always going to have four Sundays. You always have four Sundays in Advent. Okay, we've gone through the Marian feast days. Okay, a key week in Advent is the third Sunday you see the, the pink candle is lighted. And that pink candle is lighted the third week because it's Laetate Sunday, which means the Sunday of joy. Why? Because Jesus is about to be born. And the birth of Jesus is an infinite source of joy. Infinite source of joy. Okay, how many, how many mothers here? Okay, do you, do you remember 
Okay, when you're about to have your first child, remember? Were you joyful? Probably a little bit fearful too, right? You think, is the baby going to come out backwards or sideways? Or you know, You're probably a little bit fearful. But there's probably a lot of joy of being a mother, right? Well, imagine the joy of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Mary must have had even more, more joy than you. So it's a joyful season. It's a joyful season. Okay. Advent culminates in Christmas. We celebrate the Christmas Vigil Mass, which is Christmas Eve, which is the 24th. Now, there are actually, there are actually three Christmas Masses. And we as priests, the Church allows us to say three Masses on Christmas, which I always do. You've got the Mass, you've got the Midnight Mass, you got the Mass at dawn, then you have the Mass during the day. Three, di three different readings. You all remember Luke chapter 2 when Jesus is born, but another Gospel is John chapter 1 where you read the, the prologue. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's one of the Gospels for Christmas. All right, the Christmas week is an octave. So we celebrate Christmas at four late days. We can't celebrate this glorious birthday in 24 hours. Now in that octave, in that octave, there are very important feast days of saints. December 26th is the feast day of the first martyr in the Catholic Church. And that is Saint Stephen. Saint Stephen. Uh, I've, I've never fully understood why they put the feast day of Saint Stephen the, the 26th. Um, one interpretation that I've had is that we have a tendency to have an overly sentimental interpretation of Christmas. Just uh, candy canes and Santa Claus and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and Frosty the Snowman, okay? We have a tendency to be overly sentimental. They think the church is pulling us back to reality that the after we celebrate this gory martyrdom of the first saint who was stoned to death in the name of Saint Stephen, kind of wake us up into reality that to follow Christ is to be willing to suffer for Christ, even to die for Christ. And then the day after that, we celebrate Saint John the Evangelist. Then we celebrate the Holy Innocents. Celebrate Saint Thomas Becket for the Englishmen, huh? So the first week, there are a lot of saints that are kind of surprising why they enter into that octave. And it's worthy of reflection as to the why of that. All right, January 1st, I mentioned yesterday, we enter into the new year and we celebrate the solemnity of Mary, the mother of God. All right, the first week of January, we celebrate the American saints. Did you know that? Yes, we celebrate the American saints. Do you know them? And if you're born here? I was born here in this country. Hey, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. She's a New Yorker, huh? St. John Neumann from Bohemia. And St. Andrew, A Andrew Bessette from Canada. So that week we celebrate the North American saints. We learn something new every day, huh? <laughs> we also celebrate a feast day of the holy name of Jesus in the first week. All right, in the, in the Christmas season, we also celebrate the feast day of the Holy Family. I mentioned that. And then we celebrate the feast day of the Epiphany. 
It used to be December 6th, now it's, it changes. Then we end, we end the Christmas season, which is usually about two and a half to three weeks, with the celebration of the baptism of Jesus. Okay, so with the celebration of the baptism of Jesus, we end, we end the Christmas season, we enter into a new liturgical season, which is we enter into what is called ordinary time. Church colors, Advent purple, which is a color of penance. Christmas season, white. Now we enter into ordinary time and the priest is gonna be wearing green unless we celebrate a saint or a martyr. So we enter into ordinary time with the color green. So what we move, okay, now what ordinary time is, so we're into the Mass, we're into the liturgical cycle, we're moving from the infancy of Christ, the infancy narratives during those three weeks, the Christmas season, we're moving into the public life of Christ. Got that? Hello? We're moving into the public life of Christ. And if you ever read the Gospels, especially the Synoptics, which would be Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels, you've got a good 75% of the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which is the public life of Christ. The, the two bookends would be what? The infancy narratives, and then you've got the Paschal Mystery, which is the Passion, Death, and Resurrection of Christ. So you've got the ordinary time in which we're reading and meditating the public life of Christ. Now, to make it easy to follow the public life of Christ in the Mass, I, I like to categorize the public life of Christ chronologically about three years. Okay, what were the activities that Christ carried out in three years? I think once, once I say this, it can be much easier to read the gospel and follow the Mass. One is that Jesus did a lot of teaching. Matthew presents Jesus as the new Moses, okay? The new Moses is Jesus Christ. Abundant teaching. What else? Jesus also carried out miracles. Miracles of two forms. Miracles over nature, walking on the water, turning water into wine, okay? Calming the storm, the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes. These are over nature. But the most abundant miracles of Christ would be miracles of healing. Healing the sick. Even raising the dead on three occasions. Okay, then the third thing that Jesus did was he carried out exorcisms. You know, you can deny the reality of the devil, but the devil is still going to exist. Okay? Jesus was in constant collision with the devil. He actually starts off his public ministry 40 days and 40 nights in the desert, and then the devil comes, tempts him three times, and Jesus rebuffs the temptation by utilizing biblical passages. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. So that would be, okay, we're moving from the Christmas season into ordinary time. Now, there are two ordinary times. There's a shorter one, then there's a very long ordinary time. Ordinary time should be time in which we do, we carry out our ordinary obligations in our daily life with extraordinary love. Amen? 
We carry out the ordinary, the ordinary obligations of our daily life with extraordinary love. And the priest is wearing green. This is just a side note, but um, I like to quote for you the first poem that I wrote when I was eight years old. Can I? It's short. Can I? Okay, this was before my conversion. I was eight years old. Are you listening? Green is the grass on the ground. Green is the money I have found. <laughs> This is pre-conversion of, of Father Broom, okay? So green is the color of ordinary time. Now, speckled in this ordinary time, you're gonna see the priest coming out in white and red. So we celebrate a Marian feast day, it's gonna be white. When we come out, in red, it is not to celebrate communism. No, it's not that. <laughs> I'm not a commie, huh? No. It's to celebrate the martyrs because of the blood that the martyrs shed. If you notice, if you, if you go to daily mass, almost every week, almost every week, you're gonna have a priest coming out on red. Sometimes, sometimes three days in a row. Just that you're aware of, last century was the century that had the most martyrs in the history of the Catholic Church, the 20th century. In this century, it's, we're getting more and more. So the shedding of the blood, according to Tertullian, is a seed for Christian growth. And you kill a martyr, instead of extinguishing the Catholic faith, more people become Catholics because of the blood of martyrs. That's the way it works. Okay, so, ordinary time, ordinary time ends with ash, what? Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday. I was telling a group of people well, a a Ash Wednesday, it, it changes according to the church cycle. But Ash Wednesday, solemnly, we enter into the holy season of Lent. Holy season of Lent. I've noticed, I don't know about you people, but Ash Wednesday is a time in which many graces flow. I was with m many of you in, Advent, in, in Lent. Some of you did the exercise with me. I was given the exercises in three different places. Here, St. John the Baptist in Baldwin Park and St. Peter Chanel. We were dealing with in between 900 and 1,000 people. That's a lot of souls. Not to mention online. Online, probably double or triple that. And it, for, for various reasons. One is because the exercises work, right? Have you done the exercises? Did they help you? Yes. They work. <laughs> they work. If you do the exercises, they change lives. But also, Lent is a special season of grace. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something that I rarely say as a priest and religious. I can actually feel it. I, I, I barely ever say that because I don't depend upon feelings. But I can actually palpably feel Lent, the graces that flow in that season, in which I, I notice people, are, people are, are more open to God. I try to be more open to God too, where God's graces flow. And thanks be to God, we have it every year. And it's, it's a good 40 days. So Lent, we enter into the, what is called, the, two of the strong seasons in the year. Advent is one, and the other one would be that of Lent. Okay, Lent, season 
of grace, a season of conversion, a season which God is knocking at our doors, beckoning us to come back to him with all of our hearts. Okay, I think it's, I think it's worth the while to spend at least a couple of minutes on, on Ash Wednesday. Because it's, uh, I th feel if we don't understand it, we're, we're kind of like we don't understand the whole thrust of Lent. Okay, Ash Wednesday. The ashes. Okay, are you liturgically obliged to receive ashes on Ash Wednesday? No. What's that? No. Pretty well formed. Most people feel that you have to get your ashes. You should try to get them. But if you, if you don't get the ashes, that's not morally culpable. However, we have to say, in the Mexican culture, we've got some Mexicans here. Man, that is numero uno, okay? That's numero uno. We in our parish, we probably had, I, I, I don't know, I'd say eight to 10,000 people come in to get the ashes in the, in the peak of our parish. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Now, question, how many of those people will come back to church and go to Mass on Sunday? <laughs> how many? Uh, maybe 10%, 15%, 20%, maybe. Which causes me sadness in a certain sense. But also, I'm happy because what we do before the pandemic, especially starting at 4 o'clock to 7.30, 8 o'clock, we pack the church. And for me, as a priest, the more people in front of me, the better. I love crowds. I love crowds. <laughs> I'm at my best, no? So I preach, and I preach, and I enjoy doing martillazos. I mean, I <laughs> oh yeah, because these are souls to be saved. These are people that, that only come to church occasional. Maybe you heard of the occasional Catholics? They come to church when they're hatched, matched, and dispatched, right? <laughs> Right? Hatched, matched, and dispatched. No? Baptized, married, and the funeral. So, the meaning, okay, what is the meaning of the ashes? The ashes come from the palms, from Palm Sunday, right? Now, that's one of the reasons why I have these classes. If you just receive the ashes, you don't know why. Religiosity without education degenerates into superstition. I'll repeat. Religiosity without education degenerates into superstition. If you've ever gone to one of those curanderos that they have all over the place in L.A., okay? You know what a curandero is? If you ever go to them, if you, if you go, they're going to have Our Lady Guadalupe, they're going to have holy, holy Water, they're going to have Statue of St. Jude, they're going to have a cross, they're going to have um, holy cards, right? Hello? Ah, so you've gone, okay? Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, that's the way it is. They've got these sacramentals. 
Because the, the, the human person is religious. We're, we're, we are religious by nature. We are. We're all religious by nature. And if we don't find the true God, we're going to fall in love with the false God. And isn't that idolatry? What's idolatry? What is idolatry? It's when we place any person, place, thing, object, even idea above God. That's the nature of what an idol is. Idolatry. So the ashes that you receive, the priest can say one of two short phrases, and they are taken from the Bible. You know what they are? One is taken from Mark chapter 1, verse 15, which would be, we don't know, Father, we're not Protestants. Okay, well, I'll tell you. I heard you, okay, I heard you. I was reading your mind. We're not Protestants, Father, okay? Okay, Mark 1, 15 is the first preaching of Jesus in the New Testament. It happens to be the third luminous mystery also. Be converted and believe in the gospel, or repent and believe in the gospel. That's what the priest and minister says when he's imposing ashes on your forehead. Then another, taken from Genesis chapter 3, after the fall of Adam and Eve. The priest says, he says, remember that you're dust, and and to dust you shall return. So two essential ideas. So we just received the ashes, we don't know why. I mean, I think we're almost falling into superstition. Feel we got that, that's our pasaporte for los mojados, okay? So you can get, in, get into heaven, okay? It's not a pasaporte for los mojados, okay? It's a symbolic gesture that has meaning. So conversion and our mortality. What does mortality mean? One day, one day we're all going to die. That's what it means. That's what the church is presenting to us. We gotta be converted. We got to be converted. But we have to recognize one day we're going to die. We don't know the day nor the hour. I heard a story. There was a, a, a huge church with thousands of people that wanted their ashes. And there was just one priest. Imagine a priest imposing 8,000 ashes. Can you imagine doing that? So the priest asked the sacristan, Larry's a sacristan, right? Asked the sacristan if he could help out. This sacristan was very timid and he had a very bad memory. So the priest told him, look, you just have to put your finger in the bowl of ashes and then you have to put the ashes and say you are dust and you should return into dust. So the sacristy was very reluctant. He said, okay. So he goes and he sees a hundred people online. <gasps> Hi. You are. You are. So he goes to the priest and says, Father, I f forgot. I, I froze. You know? And okay, calm down, calm down. You are dust and you should return to dust. Okay. So he goes in front of now there's there's five hundred people there. Oh boy. He says, you, 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 you. I mean he, he stutters, no? He goes to the priest and says, Sorry, Father. 
uh, I don't remember what I'm supposed to say. So the priest gets, sees the two lines getting longer and longer and longer. And the priest says, you know, you are dust, you shall return to dust. So he goes, now he sees there's 500 people waiting impatiently. And he scratches his head, he can't even open up his mouth. Goes back to the priest and says, Father, what am I supposed to say? Exasperated, frustrated, the priest says to the sacristan, you are a dummy, you're always gonna be a dummy. <laughs> so he went in front of the people and he started to push the ashes out. You're a dummy, you'll always be a dummy. You're a dummy, you'll always be a dummy. You're a dummy, you'll always be a dummy. You are a dummy, you'll always be a dummy. He said that another 5,000 times. <laughs> That's a story I like to tell on Ash Wednesday, no? And we, we really are a dummy if we only come for the ashes and then we give up the church. In a certain sense, we are a dummy. We just come for the ashes and we don't come for anything more. Now, to arrive at this conversion, to arrive at this conversion, we have to try to live out the gospel for Ash Wednesday, which would be, any of you know? Matthew chapter 6. You know what that is? No, Father, we're not Protestants. Okay, Jesus gives us our game plan. We had a priest with us about 20 years ago, and he explained it in a tri-dimensional way, and it's this. We have to go up, in, and out. Amen? We have to go up, in, and out. You want to try it? We have to go up, in, and out. Once again, we have to go up, in, and out. We have to go up through prayer. Through prayer? Lent is a time to pray. Pray more. We have to go in by practicing penance, by fasting, by denying ourselves. You're not going to arrive at the mystical life without the ascetical life. All right? No mystical life without the ascetical life. Ascetical means exercise, exercising our own self-discipline. So going up, going in, and going out, almsgiving, almsgiving, giving to other people. So if we can live out, we can live out those three different dimensions by praying more, not less, by praying more, augmenting our prayer life, by practicing penance, giving up something. The most important thing we give up in Lent, we give up sin, S-I-N. <laughs> That's the best fasting, giving up sin and practicing virtue. In almsgiving, we're practicing charity. How many of you here know Spanish? Candil in la calle, oscuridad en la casa, huh? Candil in la calle, oscuridad en la casa. It's a good proverb, huh? What does it mean? It means that outside the house, we're very charitable. We're charitable. But inside the house, we're not at all. Outside the house, we're kind, we're loving, a big smile. We turn back to the house, we turn into a monster, okay? 
You know, Teresa of Avila said to the, to the nuns, she said, some of you, you're angels outside the convent, but then you come back and you're a devil's inside the convent, okay? He said, Teresa of Avila, well, you, you're living a double life. We should be living charity at all times. Amen? So my friends, uh, we're in good company. The time has already gone by. So you're gonna get a handout now on the church here. We've gotten through about half of it. So we'll follow up tomorrow and bring a friend, okay? The Lord be with you. The intercession of Mary and St. Joseph and Teresa of Avila and God's angels and saints. May God bless all of you in the name of the Father and of the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Make sure that you get your hand out, okay?